Um, you said that uh, Kenya is committed, and uh, in your uh, Carter speech in Atlanta, you said it's based on humanitarianism, helping Haiti out. But can you explain the geopolitical goal, 12,000 kilometers away from Nairobi, when schools in the counties of Baringo, West Pokot, and Turkana have not yet opened because of the banditry problem, yet you are committing our national police force to Haiti, and where is the priority, this, this being one of your major manifesto pillars, talking about security, and to the extent that even the Defense Cabinet Secretary talked about the deployment of, if need be, the Kenyan military or the special personnel to make sure that schools are open, children go to school in areas that are bandit prone in Kenya. Why are you committing to Haiti when we have a problem back home? Is it an irony that you are putting the fire in the faraway neighbor's home when are, are on our own home is on fire? Thank you very much. I made a commitment to the people of Kenya to sort out insecurity in the North Rift. I have followed that with action. As we talk, there are 3,000 military officers in the North Rift, 2,000 police officers in the North Rift. We have renovated the first 15 schools and completed. We have reopened 20 schools already that were closed in the North Rift. And that exercise is ongoing. We have made tremendous progress in making sure that we create security at home. But that does not take away our responsibility. Even as we were deploying troops and policemen in our own country, in North Rift, to sort out the banditry problem, we still deployed a thousand, trip, uh, a thousand troop, uh, troops to DRC Congo because that is our neighborhood. We have 5,000 troops in Somalia because equally that is our responsibility. And Haiti should not be an exception. That's why deploying a thousand security men to Haiti speaks to the same belief and commitment to peace and security. Next question from April Ryan. Mr. President, President Biden, President Ruto, thank you. Um, first of all, when you talk about Haiti, President Ruto, you said Haiti is a collective responsibility for all nations. And for you, Mr. President, President Biden, President Ruto, do you believe that these nations can break the back of this militia that has gripped the nation there? And also, when it comes to Congo, thank you, Mr. President, for bringing up what the United States is doing for the Congo, especially as that flag was behind you uh, at Morehouse. Mr. President, could you tell me what the African Union is doing, as well as Kenya is doing, when it comes to the humanitarian crisis in the Congo? Thank you. What was my question? <laughs> Sir, your question was Haiti. Can the United yes. States and Kenya, or the nations collectively, break the backs of this coordinated militia that has the grips of the nation? That nation. Thank you. Yes. The very way we're doing it. We're not talking about a, a, a thousand-person army that's made up of trained person. This is a crisis. It's able to be dealt with. And we think we can dealt with this way with a multinational approach, with Haiti leading the way, and us providing the intelligence as well as equipment. Gangs and criminals do not have nationalities. They have no religion. They have no language. Their language is one. Okay. To deal with them firmly, decisively, within the parameters of the law. And that's why we are building a coalition of nations beyond Kenya and the U.S. Many who are making contribution towards the MSS force in Haiti to secure that country and to break the back of the gangs and the criminals that have visited untold suffering in that country. On DRC, the AU, the East African community, 
and Kenya are seized with that matter. I've just told you that Kenya had a thousand troops in Haiti. We now have another 800, not in Haiti, but in DRC. We now have another 800 troops from SADC. We are going to be having a meeting of the East African community. I did send my minister of, uh, my foreign minister to Kinshasa. They had a conversation. And shortly, we will be looking at how to begin the dialogue process under the Nairobi process. Because we believe there is no military solution to what is going on in DRC. But instead, dialogue should be able to give us the necessary momentum and outcomes that would sell the matters in, in Eastern DRC. So both the AU, the East African community, and Kenya as a country are seized of that matter. We know that the humanitarian crisis in Eastern DRC has displaced close to 7 million people. And I want to thank the United States of America for stepping in with humanitarian support for that region because it is a collaboration of different countries in different ways to deal with that situation. The rest of us are committing troops. We are committing uh, our, deploying our infrastructure to facilitate the resolution of the matters in DRC. Let me ask uh, Nancy Agutu from Kenya. She's here. Okay, Nancy. Mr. President, um, Africa is asking America to lead the way and double its contribution to the World Bank's international development assistance uh, to help developing countries access more financing to alleviate debt distress and to tackle climate change. What is your commitment on this? Thank you. Would you? I'm sorry, I didn't catch all your question. Sorry, I'm saying Africa is asking America to lead the way and double its contribution to the World Bank's international development assistance to help developing countries yes. to access financing to alleviate debt distress and to tackle climate change. What is your commitment on this? We made a major commitment to this. Number one, um, as I said, the United States has long championed in international financial institutions that provide low-cost concessional resources to the poorest developing countries, including from the IMF. To that end, my administration helped design and establish the IMF's new initiative that provides low-cost funding to, for countries that are taking steps to enhance their resilience. Important partners in Africa have the capital they need to ensure they have the capital they need to invest in their futures. We heard them and we stand with them. Now, that's why we've worked with Congress to enable the United States to make available in the coming weeks up to $21 billion in new lending resources to the IMF Trust Fund that provides concessional lending to the poorest countries. It's a little like, uh, you know, uh, having to go when you're in debt, having to go and find someone to help you out. That's what this is about. We believe supporting friends and, and this partnership is happy uh, to, we're happy to do our part. And look, we've also doubled our commitment to the uh, IDA. And I'm proud the United States is the biggest donor of the IDA in this cycle. I'm proud to be working with, alongside with Kenya to support robust financing and policy packages that are going to help the most vulnerable countries address their investment needs. There's debt and there's growth. And you can't, you got to deal with the debt before you deal with the growth. And so we're, we're trying to use international lending organizations to be able to provide that capability so people can grow. That's what it's about. This is supported by the United States and many other countries as well. Next. We're launching a new era of technology and technological cooperation between the United States and Kenya. That means new partnerships, new partnerships with industry, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, and cybersecurity. New initiatives to expand affordable internet all across East Africa. 
through education programs and bring Kenyan students to the United States to study in this country. And I'm proud to announce that I'm working with Congress to make Kenya the first country in Africa to receive funding through the Chips and Science Act, which has served us well. This funding will link their supply chain to the United States and to our partners. And spur innovation that extends from Silicon Valley in California to Silicon Savannah in Kenya, which, by the way, is already a $1 billion tech Already a $1 billion tech company. Finally, we're ensuring democracy delivers for our people. That includes Kenya's diaspora community here in the United States. <coughs> Two years ago, the nation's first black vice president, President Kamala Harris, launched the nation's first presidential advisory council on African diaspora engagement. Today, we're building on her work to strengthen long-standing bonds between our people. I also want to thank you, Mr. President, for taking action to implement the long way of public benefits organization, which provides historic protection for civil society and NGOs all across Kenya. Like you, I believe the future is going to be won by countries that have unleashed the full potential, full potential of the population. Including civil society, women, and young people. I look forward to working together to implement this act and jumpstart the anti corruption reforms of all democratic values to find our nation together. Now, let me close with this. Taken together, these are responsibilities Kenya and America must be in the years ahead. To be together as partners for security, for prosperity, for innovation, and most importantly, for democracy. But I know these responsibilities will wait the best of us. I know we'll bring it out on our nation together. But I want to thank you for again, Mr. President, for being here and knowing we have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you.
During our discussions, I witnessed past time President Biden and the U.S. government's determination to make our partnership work and resolve to spread and deepen the roots of freedom, democracy, security, and prosperity throughout the world. As my visit comes to a close, I am confident that our engagements have laid a solid foundation for us to continue the good, the good work we have begun with stronger faith and greater hope for success because in Joe Biden, Kenya, and Africa have a strong and committed friend. I thank you. 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 Thank